All right. Well, I guess we can go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. My name is Jamie, and I'll be your host. Just to give you a brief overview of Sons of Learning, we've been de developing and delivering authorized Cisco training since 1996. Technical training is our only business focus. We offer a full schedule of guaranteed to run classes for Cisco routing and switching, unified communications, contact center express and enterprise, data center, security, and wireless. In addition, we also offer Hortonworks, VMware, and Red Hat training. Sunset Learning has over 35 locations across North America, inclusive of remote delivery options as well. You can find all of our course outlines and schedule on our website at sunsetlearning.com. Today, we will be discussing new features in Cisco Unified Contact Center Enterprise version 10. And our presenter is Bruce Wilkinson. Bruce is a contact center specialized instructor here at Sunset Learning and has been focused on Cisco training, consulting, and deployment projects for over 15 years. Bruce most recently co-authored and developed the latest UCCE version 10 authorized curriculum for Cisco, for which he'll discuss later in the presentation. We have a lot of info to cover, so um, I'd like to keep all questions to the end, but definitely feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, also, if there's any questions that you think of after the presentation, you can email me directly at marketing at sunsetlearning.com. The session is being recorded and we'll send it out um, after all the sessions have been completed. With that being said, Bruce, I will let you take it from here. Okay. Thanks, Jamie. Okay, well thank you, uh, Jamie, for the introduction and thank you all for coming along and I don't know whether it's good afternoon or still good morning for some of you, I'm not sure, but welcome anyway to this um, webinar on UCCE 10. What we plan on doing uh, as we go through is to look at uh, those uh, new items um, or, or new uh, services that have been released in Contact Center Enterprise version 10, some of the, the more interesting bits. There's a quite a list of, uh, of new things, uh, many of them a little dull to be frank, you know, uh, having to do with uh, what's really truly uh, deep down under the hood. But we'll be looking more at those um, items that are impacting uh, our business rules. Um, we'll also uh, let you know what's new in UCCE 10 training, uh, because that's a slightly different structure to the sort of thing you might have been used to through Cisco. Um, I'll expand on these later in the uh, in the webinar, but um, for now, I just realise that there are in fact three classes in this uh, training suite. We have two admin classes and one deployment class. The uh, two admin classes really reflect what we believe to be the most common job roles uh, in an organisation, having to do with level one support and ad moves and changes and that sort of thing, moving through to the more complex uh, support and troubleshooting and maybe implementing those new novel or complex uh, business rules. Uh, you'll find within the Sunset Learning uh, stable that we take, again, a fairly unique approach to our labs uh, and we like to uh, suggest to folks that we, uh, to let the lab actually uh, teach the class. In traditional labs, particularly in, in Cisco cor uh, courses, uh, you may be used to sort of following step one, step two, step three, uh, press enter and bingo the bell rings and everyone's happy but you haven't really learned much other than to follow steps. Um, in our approach, we, we might uh, have you go through step one, step two, step three, only to find that the bell doesn't ring yet. Uh, and that's because there are some other configuration items still to go. Um, and we send you at that point to various uh, logs and diagnostic tools so that you really truly understand what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it. The other thing to be said about uh, uh, this training is that it has a CVP focus. Uh, in other words, there is no uh, IPIDR uh, configuration as there was in earlier UCCE training classes. This is a Cisco direction. 
and reflects the sort of development focus of UCCE uh, for uh, ICN. There was, I believe, although I didn't, I never taught it, but I believe there's a CBDI class out there and this UCCE 10 suite of classes will replace this. So you'll get to uh, do all of your CVP configuring and manipulation in uh, one or more of these suite of classes. Uh, just so everybody, I guess, is on the um, same page, um, I thought it might be useful to uh, just have a look at the products um, that are associated in a UCCE CVP uh, environment. Because uh, in the class and um, as we go through the seminar, we'll be uh, looking at and accessing uh, probably most of these uh, devices. Um, of course, we have our... Um, Ingress, the Egress uh, Voice Gateway, providing the interface between the PSDN and our UCCE environment. Uh, there may or may not be a SIP proxy, depending on the uh, scalability and the size of your uh, organisation. There will be uh, a VXML server and CVC call server, and VXML server, of course, will host your call studio projects. Uh, the CVP call server will um, manage, if you like, the interface between uh, the outside world and ITM and will provide uh, the ability to, um, or the management execution of those call studio projects, um, interrogating the customer, if you like, press one for sales, two for service, uh, that sort of thing. CVP uh, server is also capable of doing other clever things like uh, database lookups, lookups and um, all of that sort of thing, and what they will, what it will do then is to, look, to deliver into ITM um, all of that core context information, so ITM can determine uh, what agent, what skill group, what location uh, is best going to uh, service this caller. Uh, at IC, at uh, Sunset Learning, we like to sort of refer to ITM as the great decider because it's the, it's the decision maker uh, in almost every. Uh, call attempt that is made. You'll notice between ITM uh, here are two devices called PGs or peripheral gateways, one interfacing with CVP, the other interfacing with call manager. These are effectively um, our agents, um, uh, or our, our remote agents if you like, ITM's remote agents. I don't mean that in a personal point of view, but um, it is, its job is to interface with the peripheral, either CVP or call manager, and take that native protocol and deliver it into ICM in a, um, uh, a format and protocol that is understood. For instance, in this case, as is shown here, CVP will talk into the PG using JED125 service control protocol, and the PG will... Um, convert those events, if you like, into device management protocol and deliver them into the ITM central controller. Similarly, uh, call manager will deliver via JTAPing uh, events and, and agent status and telephone status type information to the agent PG here, uh, uh, which will in turn convert that into device management protocol again so ITM can um, utilise that information in its routing decisions. Notice also that the agent PG also um, hosts the CDI server, which is the uh, telephony interface between um, ICM uh, and the agent. It is the CDI server which in effect manages the agent desktop, be it uh, CAD or CDIOS or Finesse as we go through. Um, there's also been some changes in the packaging which might be useful to point out uh, at this at this moment, um, earlier versions of CVP um, had a separate uh, media server. wasn't really considered part of the CVP call server. Uh, now, when you spin the DVD, uh, the, you install the media server at the same time, and uh, this collection then is referred to now as the CVP server. Uh, the call server containing just the ICM. IVR and SIP sub-services uh, which communicate with ICM, with the gateway and with call manager respectively. Also contains, as we say, the 
VXML server as we see here. So that's just a little bit of a change, if you like. Um, you might see uh, some changes in the way uh, the documentation describes uh, that installation. So just be aware that's what that's about. Functionally, it's pretty much the same, but just a difference uh, in the packaging. So what's new in UCCE 10? Or more accurately, what's been provided after UCCE V8 X. Now the reason we make that distinction is that um, in terms of the training that's being provided, the, the formal Cisco training, those materials and uh, that information, uh, student materials, etc., was only relating to version 8. So there was no uh, class that was developed for, for V9. So someone who went along to UCCE training uh, in the past uh, would not now have caught up with any of the new uh, features that were introduced either in 9 or 10. So essentially we have lumped them all together and, and said let's, let's call them all uh, new uh, because they are now associated with this new training class. Uh, so the sorts of things that you will see uh, in the class and the sorts of things we will discuss um, in more or less detail as we go through now are virtualization, um, Finesse, the preferred agent desktop workflows, uh, package CCE. Now, uh, we mentioned package CCE only to only at this point to say that uh, there have been some enhancements. enhancements. Uh, our class is not UC, uh, package CCE, but rather UCCE10. However, I would say that probably 80% of the content that we deliver in the UCCE environment is relevant um, to packaged as well. Uh, there, are, there have been some enhancements to the web administration of UCCE um, and along with that precision queuing and congestion control, two of the types of features that are administered in UCCE via uh, the web. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, those, um, those features. Uh, also we'll talk a little about dynamic call types, what does that really mean and how does that benefit, benefit us in a um, the UCCE environment. Um, Studio VXML updates. Uh, there is departmental um, departmental uh, separation now um, for package CCE and for UCCE in a um, contact center management portal environment. Now, what we mean by that, we'll expand on it a little later. But what we mean on that uh, by that is that it's often in large organisations. The requirement or the the uh, desire to segment access to script editor based on uh, either a business unit or a department or a section or something like that or a location perhaps even in an organisation. Um, CCMP departments uh, provide that uh, capability. Um, some additional features include agent greeting. We've got quite a lengthy lab on agent greeting, and I'll run through a lot of that um, configuration in this session, depending on the, the time that we have. Uh, whisper announcements, uh, agent request API, uh, reporting intervals, multi-line, and uh, diagnostic framework. Now, diagnostic framework, again, has been uh, implemented uh, in earlier versions, but because it's um, uh, a feature which, I guess, changes the way we look at our um, our diagnosis, our initial diagnosis of um, uh, any problems during install or configuration, it's worthwhile just uh, uh, having a bit of a look at that as well. So we'll, again, if we get time, go through that sort of thing. So speaking about virtualization, uh, it is true to say that virtualization has been supported since 8.3. The difference in version 10, however, is that it's now virtualized only. So no longer um, will there be sort of native host uh, servers. It's all now virtualized. Now one of the things that you know I tend to do um, is never put up um, hardware specifications, specific hardware specifications, or even third-party software releases on a hard copy slide. Uh, the reason for that is that you know the moment you produce the slide, uh, it's out of date. Far far better, I think, to encourage people to go to the Cisco documentation and look at uh, what's being provided in the Bill of Materials or the um, uh, Reference uh, Network Design Guides, etc. 
So there are a couple of um, uh, UCS roadmap uh, documents here, which um, you know might help in getting a feel for just what Cisco's direction uh, are in terms of this virtualization. Uh, Finesse, as we know, uh, is the preferred uh, browser-based agent desktop. Um, it's preferred by Cisco, and most of the development work on desktops is going into Finesse as opposed to CTIOS uh, or CAD. It's becoming also preferred by customers, I think, in the sense that it is a browser-based facility, and therefore there's no requirement to push any clients out to uh, out to the agent uh, out to the agent desktops. Um, the agent desktop you may sort of be familiar with uh, provides all of the uh, services and, and facilities that you would be used to in CTIOS and or CAD when a call comes in. It can be controlled by a number of the buttons here that, uh, that appear. Um, equally, you have the ability um, to present to the agent call context information by displaying call variables and you get the ability, or the administrator gets the ability, to present these in a, a way that makes sense to the to the business organisation. So that's um, not particularly uh, new, but what is new um, is uh, Cisco um, workflows within Finesse. And workflows are defined as those uh, uh, applications, if you like, that um, will provide some level of support to the agent during a predefined uh, event. Uh, for instance, uh, when a call comes in and the, and the call is answered, um, uh, if there are particular conditions, some uh, uh, parameters set within the call context information, then we might perform some sort of action and that action you know, may well be to um, deliver uh, a screen pop. Now we can show you, if I just escape out of here, show you very quickly the sort of uh, thing that we're talking about here. <laughs> this, by the way, is the supervisor desktop. We, we saw the uh, uh, earlier PowerPoint slides of the agent desktop. This is just a brief insight into the, the supervisor desktop. Because I've logged in as myself and because in this lab config I'm the supervisor of two teams, you know, I need to select the team uh, uh, to display. I can display either the headquarters team and I have all the standard um, uh, features that you would expect in a supervisor screen. I can select a, uh, an agent and uh, make them ready, not ready, etc. Um, I can look at either my uh, headquarters team or another team, my Saltville team, if you like. Um, I can go from ready to not ready uh, up here, and you'll notice here there are some not ready codes. Um, be aware that with the use of finesse, the reason codes that you might be used to configuring in ICM Configuration Manager have now been replaced with the with the reason codes that are going to be um, administered in Finesse. And to see how that is done, we can go to this administration screen uh, and look uh, at the sorts of things that the admin screen now gives us in, in Finesse. Um, certainly within the initial settings, we need to point to our CTI server um, and our admin data server, and that's just part of the part of the config which locks this um, particular uh, uh, server into the correct uh, ICM configuration. Um, if we look at, say, those reasons that I talked about, here is here is our opportunity to create uh, any new reason codes that we want. We might uh, uh, have some for, for ready, not ready, for sign out, uh, or for wrapper. Now what still is relevant in the reason code, even though in Configuration Manager there's no reason codes themselves configured, you still in the uh, agent desktop need to force the agent uh, 
um, uh, those reason codes to come up. So that that configuration has not changed, and that still controls whether or not these will uh, appear or not. Um, I can, as I say, create the um, reason codes and then assign them to uh, particular teams. Uh, if I look at the salt wheel team, for instance, um, I get to be able to assign reason codes or not to members of that team. Okay, so I can assign the group meeting as a reason code for an agent that is a member of that team. Notice that I didn't see a, uh, uh, all of those reason codes, and the reason for that was that that group meeting is the only one that's not global that needs to be assigned. The rest are there by default anyway um, and, would, and would appear. Um, the new part of this, of course, as we said, is workflows. Um, and workflows uh, are reasonably, I think, reasonably straightforward. Uh, to configure uh, here, um, we can assign uh, a new workflow by just sort of giving it a name. Let's say call it demo two. Um, we'll just use the same description. Uh, now, when do I want this particular workflow to um, to kick off? Well, let's say I want to kick it off when the call is answered. Um, I'm going to apply. Um, the conditions only if all the conditions are met. I could, if I wanted to, uh, segment them and say just if any one of the conditions are met, that would be fine. So if all the conditions are met, we're going to be doing this. I want to add a condition. I might say, for instance, okay, call variable four has got to be equal to five thousand. And what that's saying, of course, is that somewhere in the logic, somewhere in the CVP front end, I'm uh, either doing a database lookup and I'm determining that this call somehow or other uh, has this ID and therefore um, requires a certain um, activity or a certain screen pop, if you like. Um, and the screen, the activity or the action that I am going to assign uh, to this uh, service is, say, demo2, action which is a browser pop handled by the finesse desktop, uh, I'll call the window demo too as well, and I just want to put up I need to do that, um, a particular uh, URL, I say that, and now I have another sort of uh, uh, workflow that I can assign to um, a particular uh, team or a particular agent desktop. So that's all uh, new for uh, version 10. We have in our class some uh, pretty cool, I think, labs uh, on that environment. Let me now go back. So just summarizing that, I suppose there are two actions supported in the uh, workflows. One is the browser pop, which we just configured. The other, an HTTP request. Um, the events that kick off uh, the workflow can be the call arrival, the call answered, which is what we configured, um, the end of a call in an outbound environment, preview, previewing an outbound option call. So a number of those sort of uh, options uh, associated with kicking off a, um, a workflow. Um, as an example, um, we might in introduce a, a, a workflow that the agent receives a screen when the call is delivered. That's what we just configured, a browser-based uh, screen pop when the call is delivered or answered uh, by the agent. Um, maybe we want to do something when the call ends, um, and what that is is um, wrap-up data automatically being written to a, uh, or posted to a database or CRM service. Um, or perhaps business logic in the workflow determines if the caller should get a, um, a post-call survey, and if they do, um, then we can do a finesse transfer um, to another uh, caller or another IBR application. Again, um, note that a lot of the configuration, all of this configuration information, all of the guidelines, etc., are present in the finesse administration guide 
release 10.0, uh, and I'd encourage you, know, you folks to take the time to look at that. Um, the other um, area of administration that I want to spend a little bit of time on is uh, the web administration. Now, in packaged CCE, web administration is really the, the tool that you most often use. And what I mean by that is configuration manager is used only for, I think, two or three, I can't remember what they are, but two or three configuration objects. In UCCE, it's the other way around. Configuration manager will still be your preferred tool for the vast majority, or in fact, every configuration uh, consideration that you want to um, you want to deploy, except for uh, precision queues uh, and agents and attributes. Now, uh, precision queues again uh, were introduced, I think, in nine dot something or other, but um, very useful to uh, uh, go over them again, I believe, because it is again the uh, preferred direction, if you like, of UCCD. And what a precision queue does is do away with the concept of um, a skill group and replace it with the concept of an agent attribute. And to some extent, that looks a little like uh, UCC uh, X, the uh, contact center express. It's not quite the same, but it's the same sort of broad concept. And what it means is, in terms of uh, the skill groups that we need to configure and script to, where in uh, the uh, skill group environment, we might have wanted to uh, queue calls to our uh, primary group of sales guys um, and give the call of the opportunity first to go to these fellows, um, even up to the point of waiting, say, 30 seconds um, for these guys to become available. If they're not, however, uh, then we're going to be looking at putting them to a sort of a second string, you know, a backup group of uh, agents who can handle the call but perhaps aren't as well skilled. Uh, as the first guide. <coughs> so, and then uh, we can do it again, uh, let's say after 60 seconds, uh, and hand it to a third group. And whether or not that suits your business need is not really the point here. The point is this is the way we would have to do it and we've got one, two, three, four, five nodes already in our, uh, in our script. So things become quite large and quite complex. <coughs> we can do that exact same thing uh, with one precision queue uh, and providing steps uh, within that queue. And again, let me look here to see that we can look at that sort of thing. So if I go to the web administration tool, Um, this is the, the tool by which I'll uh, manage those uh, agents and uh, precision queues. But just before we do that, let's just have a quick look at um, uh, the system menu here because you'll notice that we're saying there's a deployment type of uh, uh, 4,000 uh, agents in a rogger, uh, which is a router and logger. I have the ability, if you like, to change the deployment um, Settings that I might look at, uh, that I might be considering, uh, to say, you know, 8,000 agents with a router and logger separate uh, separate device. And if I configure that, what that does for me is to give me different uh, features and defaults uh, in my deployment. Now, clearly, you need to be uh, careful about you know the way in which you uh, you handle that because it um, uh, you know will require perhaps know, uh, uh, more hardware resource, etc. depending on what you want. In our lab, um, we have just chosen, before I get to think of it, 400 agents uh, and the rogger, because it is the rogger that we've got, the router and the logger um, co-resident on the one machine. <coughs> Notice uh, here under settings, uh, we can enable congestion control. 
Now, I've got a slide on this further down, but let's talk about it now while we're, while we're here. Um, under congestion control, we have the ability um, to treat the call with a particular uh, defined treatment, let's say uh, a DN default label, <coughs> um, which would be handled by the IVR, let's say the routing client default label, um, which we would do. Now, I'm assured by folks in Cisco um, that even though we've got something here that's saying the routing client is going to be dealing with this, you know, at least in some way, the activity of, uh, that the routing client needs to go through, the, the instructions, etc., cetera, are way, way, way less than if it had routed the call. So it's really taking these um, calls uh, that come in beyond this system default threshold of, say, 35 calls per second, um, and turning them away at the pass, dealing with them, you know, at the very sort of edge of the uh, UCCE deployment, if you like. This 35 uh, uh, calls per second is a system-based um, default, and you can just see, if we look back here, for instance, at the deployment, and I decide to go for 8,000 agents, And I look back here again at my settings under congestion control. Notice that I've now got a system default of 69 calls per second. So that's the sort of thing that you get when you uh, determine the, the uh, I guess, the scalability of the deployment that you're that you're looking at. So let's go back and put it back where it belongs. So notice here that we have the ability to manage um, uh, agents and uh, calls or, or bucket intervals within our calls. Um, we can manage agents here, but we cannot create agents. And the agents that show up against whatever peripheral are configured against um, are agents that have been configured within uh, UCCE or ICM Configuration Manager. What we have the ability to do, though, is to assign attributes to these agents. So if I look at, say, uh, this guy, not so good at sales, uh, I can assign a particular attribute to this particular agent. Let's say I might put Chinese language against that um, uh, agent. In other words, they are able to speak Chinese and... Uh, I'll give them support as well. And I'll give them a value in support, say, of five. Okay? Um, now, if I save that, that means this, now, this agent is now a resource which has those particular attributes. And if I'm building a, um, a routing script and I need to service a customer using those sorts of attributes, then this agent is a valid target for that. If not, then I uh, would bypass this particular agent. Those attributes, by the way, uh, are listed also here in UCCE administration, um, and we can just uh, create those fairly easily, like so. Uh, let's call this um, someone who's good at uh, Ford motor cars. I'll give it a description. Now, you'll notice here that the type of attribute can either be Boolean or proficiency. Um, in this case, if this is an attribute that's saying, you know, you're pretty good at servicing Ford motor cars, et cetera, and trucks, then you're not either good at that or not good at that. You have a particular proficiency uh, in that attribute. <coughs> and I can select then a default uh, attribute for this particular guy, and let's say three. Now, be aware, a little bit of a trap for new players, that if you're coming off UCCE uh, 8 and, and earlier, or in fact 9 or 10, the skill group priority, um, priority 1 is good, priority 10 is bad. Okay, so small numbers are good numbers in, ter in terms of uh, getting a call to a, a particular skill group. Uh, here in agent attributes, small 
numbers are bad numbers. So someone who has a value or proficiency value of 10 in a particular attribute is more skilled than that person who has an attribute of 3. So it just sometimes traps people the first time they uh, move into this area. So we've now got a forward motor attribute uh, assigned and we can go back and we can assign this forward motor attribute to uh, any one of those agents that we, we looked at before. Let's go on now having assigned or developed assigned attributes to our particular agent. Let's look at the precision cues themselves. <coughs> and here is where we would define, if you like, just what we want this precision cue to do. And here is a sort of a sample precision cue of um, called the support 99. It's a test precision cue for support. There's a service level um, type and a service level threshold, which we have the ability to, to define. Uh, most of the time, um, we will select longest available agents, but you can select most skilled or least skilled. I would be very careful in uh, making sure you really understand the way they are going to work if you do either, because um, you can get the situation where uh, either callers might wait uh, or agents might be uh, you know, totally snowed under while other people are just sitting there doing their knitting. So you just need to be a little bit careful about that. Notice when we run our precision uh, cues, uh, we have some criteria for uh, each of essentially the steps. There is a there is a consider if um, if you uh, if you want to add one um, uh, a wait time uh, of ten seconds uh, and then an expression. And in this case, we're saying if if there is an agent with an attribute uh, uh, of support that is uh, greater than or equal to one, then that person is a valid target for this uh, step. If there is not uh, a valid agent and uh, available, although they might be logged in, then I'm going to wait in this case 10 seconds for that agent to become available and after that I'm going to go to step two and at step two I'm going to say um, is there an agent available uh, who has a sales attribute of greater than four? Okay, so now whether or not they make business sense is not the point here. Um, what we're just trying to illustrate is how we might go about assigning um, a particular step within uh, each of the queues. And interestingly enough, um, when you when you define these criteria, the system will tell you how many agents you've got that match that criteria. So put apart uh, aside for a moment whether these particular criteria make sense. You can see here we are. Um, uh, adding to the pool of agents each time. So what this is attempting to do is to say, I, I really want this call answered by the agents who are most skilled to handle it in the first instance. However, I'm prepared only to wait 10 seconds uh, before I um, introduce a lesser group of agents, and I'm only prepared to wait 10 seconds for that as well before I uh, introduce my last pool. Notice in the final step here, there's no ability to wait. It'll just uh, hang around there in the queue waiting for that agent to, uh, uh, or an agent in these, this expanded pool now to, uh, uh, to become available. If I want to add a step, step four, I can look at this and I can add, say, my forward motor attribute. Let's say if there's an agent who is less than two, I'll, uh, I'll use those people. But notice this, I have no agents right now configured, okay? Because that attribute I assigned was outside those parameters, so that one agent was outside those parameters. So we need to be, again, careful. The other thing you need to be aware of um, in precision queuing is that if there is no agents logged on, for each of these criteria, then the wait time is of no effect. And the logic behind that uh, suggests that um, what's the point of hanging around for 10 seconds if there are no agents there? Different matter if they are logged on and not ready, but if they are not logged on, the assumption is they're not at their desk or they won't be for a time, so we won't uh, queue for them. 
So that essentially is the way in which we manage um, our precision queues using the web administration. There. Uh, congestion control is what we, we talked about uh, just before. Again, we noticed that that's also manageable, if you like, by the web interface. Dynamic call types are interesting. Uh, dynamic call types, you need to be aware that um, when we talk about a dynamic call type, what we mean is that you have the ability to assign a particular uh, call type to this node dynamically. It does not mean that you can create a call type dynamically. What that in turn means that any call type that um, you assign to this call type node must already um, be configured in Configuration Manager. So we'll just have a quick look here. I just let me start afresh. So if for instance I bring out a call type node and maybe as well a precision Q node because both are uh, affected by this uh, process. Um, I can I can assign in the properties of this call type node either a static uh, call type, which means I pick it from the list, okay, or I can assign it dynamically. And when I assign it dynamically, I can assign it by either call type name or call type ID. And the, to create that, I might simply say this call type is going to be equal to the call type equal to the value you see in call peripheral variable one. Okay, uh, And I can do a similar thing with the precision queue. Um, I can say uh, I will pick one of the precision queues that have already been built or I can dynamically assign this precision queue node oops, I'm sorry with the formula uh, and the value equal to, say, call uh, ID peripheral variable 2. And I, and I have the ability to create uh, an expression there as simple or as complex as I want to. Now, that's not quite uh, all we need to do, of course, because we would need also to set a variable. I'm going to set the variable PV1 equal to the value, say, now that name, of course, must be um, a call type that is already there. Um, so if I'm looking now at that sort of logic, this will set the, the value called proof of variable 1 equal to call type 1, uh, a previously configured call type, uh, and so this node then becomes call type 1. And similarly, in the precision queue, I can say setting peripheral variable 2 equal to, oh, let's do something that Support 99. So this precision queue then uh, is now going to be the support 99 uh, precision queue. Now, can you sort of imagine that back in CVP, when I'm collecting call context information, I collect, you know, maybe some database lookups, um, some different sorts of uh, uh, features that the customer requires, and I put within those variables. Um, in CVP or in the front end, those particular values. So these 
values while I've shown them here in, in ICM. It's essentially illustrative only because they would most likely be set in some way uh, back in a, uh, uh, in a CVP front end. But it gives you the ability, if you like, to be much more concise in your scripting and for the one script logic to be able to maintain or, or carry the logic through for a number of different types of calls. Uh, the, um, dynamic call types. Uh, departmentalization, if you like, we talked about briefly in the introduction. It's simply the ability of the uh, the organisation to segment script editor on the basis of you know business operations or departments or sections uh, or locations, etc. Essentially, it provides a managed access uh, to script editor. So it means I can make changes to skill groups, precision cues, agents, routing and scripting changes, but only for those that are assigned to my department, if you like. In UCCE, that is managed in the contact centre management portal or CCMP uh, department configuration. Uh, in package CCE, um, it's different. In package CCE, that's going to um, be provided via the web administration. But for us, and notice that CTMP is not necessarily a, um, it's not a mandatory uh, option, but if you want to implement uh, the, this departmentalization, then you do need CTMP. Uh, Multi-line support um, quickly supports the monitoring and, and control of a second uh, non-ACD line. Let me go there quickly and show you what that's about. Let's go to Configuration Manager. Explorer. Notice down here in the agent phone line control, um, I can uh, have either a single line or all line. Um, and what that's doing is, is allowing the agent to um, have a second, you know, maybe a, a DID line or a second line that can be used for customers to call that agent directly. Um, the, what we mean by the fact that this is now supported is that this second line is monitored and reported on. Okay? Um, you can uh, define um, whether the state of the agent when they pick up or whether when they are on that second line. In other words, we can say that the agent stays available uh, or the agent goes not ready. So again, it's, a, it's an, a, uh, an approach that is going to satisfy a lot of customers, I think, um, in their ability to have that second line, because that's something that a lot of uh, customers have uh, often sort of asked for, the ability to have that second line, but um, uh, still manage and, and report on it. I mean, you can have a second line, but if you can't manage it or report on it, it's not that useful. Uh, agent greetings, um, there's quite a large lab in our classes on agent greeting. I'll run through sort of fairly quickly the sorts of things that you do here with this. But what it does is allow for um, a personalised greeting to be played to the caller uh, before the caller is presented to the agent. So the call comes into, into the agent. Um, the uh, system delivers the agent greeting to the uh, to the caller and to the agent and then connects the two. Um, there are five steps in configuring uh, agent greeting, essentially five steps, there's a few more, but five main steps, uh, and they are in call manager, in the gateway, in the media server, CVP, and in ICM. And quickly, because I'm running a bit short of time, um, the important things are in uh, call manager, you need to uh, configure the built-in bridge. You can do that uh, on a per phone basis uh, or on a system-wide basis. Um, notice though that the old 7960s uh, just won't cut it for this application. Um, we need to be configuring the gateway for agent greeting and that means loading in some additional uh, configuration files in the gateway to support this application. You need to enable FTP server so that you can deliver your 
agent greeting um, uh, way files to uh, all of the media servers uh, in the organisation. Um, configuring the media server also to support uh, agent greeting is create is required. You'll normally create a folder for agent greetings and um, set the cache uh, or the content content expiration um, to some uh, number that suits you. And what I'm saying there is that it's very often required that that agent greeting has an expiration not like some of the other uh, prompts. You might want to have it almost permanently. Um, so you need to be uh, alert to that sort of thing. Um, more on the FTP uh, service, we'll create or copy the application prompts for agent greeting. Um, there is, by default, when you install uh, CVP, a number of default prompts that can be used for uh, the agent greeting recording. Um, you need to configure up CVP for agent greeting, <coughs> um, adding more media servers as we go through, etc. Uh, you need also to look at the VXML server application um, because uh, re remember the VXML server is hosts uh, the projects, the um, uh, VXML projects, if you like, and so agent greeting is one of those projects which will need to be uh, considered. Uh, in ICM, uh, we need to be uh, configuring our call type for agent greeting. And notice also, by the way, I, I didn't mention it before, but let me mention it now. Um, when you are defining the agent greeting message, and an agent has the ability to define several of them, and that might depend on the sort of call context which one is played, those greetings are, um, have the agent ID appended to them as well. Uh, which means when, when the agent is um, selected by ICM, it knows the agent ID, so it appends, <coughs> pardon me, it appends that agent ID to the agent greeting name. So my greeting is not the same as Jamie's greeting is not the same as somebody else's greeting. Um, we'll be configuring micro apps, um, uh, we'll be importing uh, some example agent scripts again, which are default. Um, one of the things we find when we do that is that a lot of the objects and names are different to our labs, so you get a, you get an opportunity then to um, manipulate, if you like, or um, use the unmapped objects tool to, be, to ensure that your script is going to uh, is going to run. Uh, I'll just flip through these quickly, I think, because I want to leave a little bit of time for questions if there are any. Um, this is really just talking about the, the, the script that runs uh, and the fact that we eventually do test that service. <coughs> so essentially what happens you know, with our agent greeting then is that um, the steps one and two after the agent answers the customer call, the agent PIN sends a route request to the router and gets the route response back at step three. Sorry, let me do this. Make it a bit larger for you. Uh, at step three, up here, the agent uh, team instructs the call manager to connect to the VRU to add uh, media to the call. So this is sort of saying um, the call is coming in, but we want to attach this uh, WAV file or play this WAV file. So call manager makes the search at step four. Uh, uh, call manager makes the server call to the CVP. After CVP answers that call, call manager sort of allocates the agent's phone built-in bridge resource. So we're talking here about the agent's phone and the built-in bridge uh, being allocated at that point. Um, steps 5 through 12 are sort of lumped in uh, here, but CVP gets a run script request from, uh, from the route. Uh, the ICM router, uh, and at 13, CVP instructs the VXML gateway uh, to play the agent greeting media file, and the VXML uh, voice gateway plays the phone to the phone, or plays the file, I'm sorry, to the phone's built-in bridge, and both the agent and uh, the customer hear that greeting. So I, I know that that's rushed, um, and I apologise for that, but I just wanted to get, or to give you some sort of insight into you know, 
some of the, the labs that we uh, that we run and the, the depth to which we go in, in our lab. So that and uh, uh, Agent Whisper, which is another facility, are some of the things that you'll get um, to be able to configure, I think, in uh, AUCCE Part 2, Administration Part 2. Um, Agent Request API is another uh, service. It's, it's the first Cisco uh, UCCE service that employs social miner, uh, and it has the ability to <coughs> capture <coughs> con um, uh, customer information from uh, an agent uh, API. So it's got a lot of uh, sort of benefits, if you like. Uh, for example, if we're interfacing with a mobile app, there's no waiting in the queue. Uh, with call with callback, by the way, um, no typing into account info. Callback only when the, the calendar is free. There is um, location awareness. For example, if this application is some breakdown service, and we're we're interfacing with a mobile app, you know, via GPS, etc., we can dispatch our cars, our vans to the to the right location. Uh, reporting intervals is um, now either 30 or 15 minute updates. And you might remember in um, the database schema, we had, you know, agent um, events to half and all of those sorts of tables. Um, we now have a number of event tables which reflect whatever setting <coughs> we have uh, in our configuration. And they might be 15 minutes or 30 minutes, but not both. Uh, and before you sort of jump in and say, well, I'm going to do 15 minutes, um, be aware that that takes up more space in your database, et cetera, et cetera. So again, it's a business requirement, but it was driven by a number of customers <coughs> pardon me, who wanted that sort of service. So that essentially is a number of the new features, et cetera. Just talking very quickly now about the training structure. Um, as I mentioned, there are three classes, uh, UCC Part 1 and Part 2. And essentially they reflect what we believe are the job roles of most organisations. Part one being a sort of a level one support, add moves and changes, and some basic scripting and configuration. Part two uh, moves up into say level two support, which has perhaps more advanced scripting, more advanced formula, etc., and implementing new novel or complex business requirements. So it's a it's a sort of a level above to the to the more experienced guy. Um, we also include in that uh, a lot of troubleshooting and support on the basis that, um, you know, we can't fix everything ourselves and sometimes we need to interface with TAC, <coughs> pardon me, and the first thing TAC is going to ask you to do is to run a, a log or turn up a trace or whatever. So um, we deal and play around with that sort of thing in our labs in part two. Uh, in our um, deploying uh, UCCE or a DUCCE class, um, we, of course, consider all of the uh, installation considerations and uh, uh, run through and install from scratch uh, a fully functional UCCE. The course concentrates predominantly on that, so the configuration and scripting that we do in that class is probably just enough to verify our installation. So and you can sort of judge, you know, if you're a, if you're a newbie, then you need to come to uh, part one. If you have got some experience, then perhaps you could start at part two, but be aware that we do, um, you know, overviews and introductions very, very quickly because we assume, you know, you've got this sort of part one knowledge. And, of course, um, if you're a partner and uh, your role is uh, installing and designing uh, UCC deployments, then deploying UCC 